Hello and welcome to this week's Market Outlook webinar. I'm David Jones and I hold these every Wednesday lunchtime in conjunction uh, with Aondo. And it is, you know, what it says in the tin. It's a, a look at what's been happening in the major markets, stock markets, uh, currencies and some of the commodities over recent days and what to look out for in, in the days ahead. If you're watching the recorded version of this, it was held live at 12.30 on Wednesday, November the 2nd. Let me just put the risk warning up. It's a bit odd at the moment because clearly we've got this US election next um, Tuesday. Yesterday there was something of a shock where it seemed that in some polls at least Mr. Trump had uh, crept ahead. So we saw uh, US stock markets fall quite heavily yesterday and we'll have a look at this in a bit more depth because one index at least, the S&P 500, that's what we're going to start off with, has broken a major level. So I think we've got you know, we've got some odd days ahead and clearly plenty of volatility. I think it'll be a relief to all of us when all of this is out of the way. Um, but also today, I think because some of the markets are, I don't think there's as many opportunities as maybe there is uh, some weeks because you know because of the election next week. So I'm going to talk a bit as well about um, when to move stop losses. I've, I've slightly changed my approach on this in um, recent months and it and it does seem to be an improvement on how I've done it before. I think you know plenty of us you know will often struggle about well when do we get out of a trade, when do I start trading a stop loss. So I'll just talk about some ideas about that as well halfway through the webinar. But for now let's just let's just crack on with um, looking at some of the markets. So I'm using <coughs> Aondo's trading platform Trade Hub. So I thought the market we start off with is I think probably the, the most important one to watch over the next couple of days. This is the S&P 500, you know. So for I think for plenty of us, when we think about U.S. markets, we think about the Dow. Uh, the Dow is only uh, made up of 30 shares, so it's um, not you know a particularly broad representation of U.S. markets. The S&P 500, as its name suggests, is made up of 500 shares. And, and yesterday, we I put this on Twitter a couple of times. We saw this big level break. Um, if we look at what happened? Clearly, that's the, the Brexit uh, sell-off there, and then a big recovery from that. Then we had markets sideways during the summer. Then they fell off a cliff in early September, and it spent much of the past six weeks um, just just treading water. You know, and we saw when the market came back down to this level. Is it 2108? I think was the level. So yeah, 2108 was the low. <clears throat> And then the market, the S&P recovered up to 2175. That's sort of area. Came back down to it. There's a good buying opportunity. Middle October, when it came down to 2114, bounced back up to 2150. And then yesterday it was coming down again. And I was, you know, fully expecting this area to hold 2108 to 2114 to hold. We see the buyers come back in and just see the market, you know, range again back up to here. But we saw it break. You know, it, it did look like it managed to close just on the support, what was the close, 2107.6, but it's, it's a really big level, you know, and when we see these big levels tested, you know, the assumption is with support and resistance, levels that have been important in the past should be important in the future, you know, so it's, it's a, I think it's quite a, a, a critical break this, it'll be interesting to see how it performs over the next couple of days, you know, you could take an aggressive trade would be the market's overreacted. The market's has overreacted to the poll, the election poll from yesterday, and you're going to be a buyer. You know, we're going to see the market pull its way back into that trading range. So the low from yesterday was 2097. So an aggressive strategy is to be a buyer at 2106, where it is now, with a stop below 2097. And I think that's you know that's a reasonably sensible trade to do. If you're going to, you know, you, you know, I'm not a big fan of the the squiggly lines, the oscillators in the bottom of charts. You know, but we have gone oversold on the RSI, the 10-day RSI, not surprising. It hasn't done, you know, too bad a job in recent months, maybe a bit early, as these things tend to be in calling the turns, you know, but but done reasonably, reasonably well. But I think it's, it's an interesting one, very interesting one to watch the next couple of sessions. And clearly, because in the UK we've wound our clocks, which way did they go? Back? They went back, didn't they, on Sunday? Uh, the US market this week is opening at, at 1.30 until whenever it is they open, they wind their clocks back. So in an hour's time, the US market will be open. But I think it's a really interesting one to watch. I think there's been some good opportunities in the S&P from a short-term day trading point of view last week. I, I did reasonably okay on sort of short-term trades last week, just sort of playing off the previous day's lows and big levels. Uh, I, I was driving down the M4 yesterday, so I missed that, but I definitely, I think, would have been trying to buy 
uh, a bounce ahead of these big levels, which never came. But but let's see what happens. And this is this is the hourly chart that we're looking at here. And you can see, I suppose you know it, it did reject those lows pretty quickly. But it, it you know 21.14 to 20 to 21.08 to 21.14 was a big area of support, and it did just go sailing through that. So let's see what happens today. I think we could see, you know, quite a nervous session uh, in in U.S. trade. This afternoon, but I think that that low. I think if we see that low broken from from yesterday, that 2097 level, you know, we could see even more pressure on this market. But interestingly, you know, these things they, they don't occasionally that they won't move in tandem. Look at the Dow. Let's go back. To the, so I, I say the S and P 500 is the broader U.S. stock market. But let's take a look at the Dow yesterday because. Again, similar sort of moves, obviously, that the Brexit sell-off, then the rally, <clears throat> boring summer, sells off in September, then just, just sideways, a very, very rangy market. But on the Dow, if I plonk my line here, there we go, that was the low. So I think it was an out of hours low, just ahead of 17,900 on the 12th of September. Um, interestingly, in the sell-off yesterday, the Dow got as low as 17.936. The Dow didn't break the level. So, again, if you wanted to have a bullish argument, you know, to be a buyer down here looking for the market to maybe get back into the range, you could use that, I suppose, the Dow, the fact that Dow is held uh, as, as a maybe a little tick for your bullish argument. But I think we will see some nervous trading. So the big, you know, big level to watch in the Dow is that 17,900 level. But I suppose it is, it is quite interesting that we haven't, we didn't see that break yesterday, even though the, the S&P did poke its nose uh, below, below those old lows. And this is the overnight trading. So early hours this morning, well, six to eight this morning, uh, the market came back down towards those. Uh, in hours lows yesterday and held. So I think that's a really big big area to watch. So again, the aggressive trade for this afternoon for the for the day trade clickers amongst us. You know, if we saw the market pull back, you know, towards I don't know, seventeen nine fifty, where is it now? Seventeen nine eighty the day. You know, and see some strength come in, an aggressive trade would be to be a buyer with a stop uh, under either the low from yesterday or that low from the beginning of September. But I do think, for me, these are you know the interesting ones to watch now in the next couple of days. Uh, what's going on with, of course, with the U.S. election on Friday? We've got the payrolls. Maybe maybe not as important this month as the election, but on Friday, <coughs> so Friday lunchtime. So it will be again. It will be a funny time. It'll be 12:30 UK time, won't it, on Friday? The non-farm payrolls, the U.S. unemployment numbers, and normally plenty of volatility off the back of that. So we've got some, some interesting days ahead, but this time next week when we do the webinar, the election will be out of the way. So hopefully we'll see markets returning to normal. But I do think that's those are the markets to watch are the US stock markets. So a quick look at the European markets. We haven't seen as um, exaggerated a reaction in European markets. So this is the FTSE. So the FTSE is, um, is off, what, two, 200? Also, 250-ish points off those highs. You know, we've got a clear, you know, downtrend in place, but we've got, or a short-term downtrend in place anyway. But we've got plenty of little pockets of support. 6770, uh, 6600 is a big level for the FTSE. I mean, clearly, it is going to be dictated by what goes on with these uh, U.S. markets. But the FTSE is still under you know, a little bit of pressure. That's these are the that's the 30-minute chart. So FTSE under a little bit of pressure, quite nervous trading with what we're seeing going on uh, in the US, but some, some big levels just below uh, where, well not just below, but you know a bit below where we are now. It's a similar story for the DAX, for the German market. And I do think with these markets, it is, it's not irrelevant to look at them at the moment, but clearly so much direction for European shares is going to be determined by what we see in US stock markets. But on the DAX, you know, we're coming off that that high. We've got support coming in, 10,350, big support down here, sort of 10,180, 10,200. So uh, there's scope for a bit more weakness in these markets, but you would expect some strength to keep coming in. But like I say, the markets to watch, US stock markets uh, in the next few days. <clears throat> Let's leave that to one side and um, take a look at some currencies. And this is where I'm, I'm going to talk in here about a trade I did over the last week, and this is where I'm going to link it in to the uh, to um, talking about stops, talking about moving stops. But first of all, before we do that, let's just look at a couple of currencies with, with some interesting trends at the moment. Euro sterling, 
just just again to remind ourselves, you know, clearly since the EU referendum, the euro has been trending up. We've seen some old spiky moves. The market sold off a little bit, but again, it's pushed higher over the last week. You know, and and as ever, you know, the, the trend is your friends in a market like this. You know, we we still want to be a buyer of dips, and if you flip it over to the hourlies, you know, we do have. Actually, I think I need to go maybe a bit more intraday than that. I had a look earlier, four-hour chart. So now each candle represents uh, four hours. So there is a really uh, solid trend on this in this euro sterling. I think I took it off that low there, whenever that was, and it looked look at that almost textbook trend. So if we had our Harry hindsight trading hats on, you know, we should be going back to uh, 21st of October. And buying it there, it's not moved that far. In all fairness, it's what it, what was it back then? 88, 90, and it's now 89, 90. So it's moved 100 points. But you can see, you know, we've got a clear trend going on in euro sterling. So for me, at the moment, any weakness back towards what well, towards that 89, 100-ish level, you know, I'd want to be a buyer. You can see we've got the classic higher highs and higher lows. It's been selling off. Uh, this is a four-hour chart. So over the last 12 hours, we've seen a little bit of weakness, um, but this is a market. Where still, you know, the, the the trend is still up. So on euro sterling, I would still definitely be a buyer. New Zealand dollar, US dollar is uh, is is one we've looked at in the past. It was suggested, I think, by somebody on a webinar a few weeks ago now, uh, looking at the trend in the New Zealand dollar, US dollar, and we have seen, I think, a little bit of weakness. Hang on, I think I've just clicked on the wrong thing there. Hold on a second. But you know, as these things do. Uh, the trend has managed to resume itself. Hang on, it seems like it's uh, got frozen on that New Zealand dollar. Let me flip it, flip it back. Here we go, New Zealand dollar. So the trend has managed. Uh, let me close it. When in doubt, close it down and open it up again. There we go. So if we flip it over to a daily chart. So we had had for, for quite some time uh, a downtrend for the, for the Kiwi against the US dollar. But then for much of the last 12 months and maybe a bit more, we've seen a market that's been trending upwards. And of course, as these things happen, when it got pointed out to us, to me on the webinar, I said, that's a great, that's a great uptrend. And since then, it'd been something of a, of a corrective mode. If we draw our trend, you know, it looks something like that. But again, look at that. It's it's, it's almost almost a text textbook example, and I think it shows. You know, it's something I suffer from. I think, like a lot of people, is having the patience to wait for the right trades to set up or the the right entry point to set up. And it's, there's a perfect example here. I think we first started looking at this back in September. The market came off. You know, it came off 300, 350 points. But once again, this trend held, and the markets, you know, bounced back a couple of hundred points. So for New Zealand dollar, US dollar, the logical target is for a push back to 7,500 and higher. And for me, you know, I'd only consider this trend uh, broken, you know, if if it sort of slipped back between the, these old lows from the summer around about 69.50. So on this one at the moment, you know, it looks like, for me anyway, I've missed the boat. But if it pulled back and set up another opportunity, you know, back down at these sort of area, it looks like another good opportunity to jump into that trend. Okay, the one I want to talk about now is a slight change that I've made to my, uh, the way, how quickly I move stop losses. I think like a lot of people, um, you know, I, I religiously use stop losses and, you know, one of the frustrations often is, um, is not so much getting stopped out, then the market goes the way you thought it was going to be. I, I, I talked about a trade I did on the dollar, Canadian dollar. Uh, last week, I think, where I got stopped out, and then the market went two, three hundred points up, as I was expecting, but without me. That's you know, that's that's part of life. That's part of trading. It would happen now and again. But I think that maybe the frustrating bit is um, moving your stop. You know, that the market starts to move in your favour, so you move your stop, and then the market comes back a little bit, takes your stop out, so you get stopped out for for maybe a small profit. But then, of course, it reverses and carries on going the way you thought it was going to go. For me, that that's far more frustrating. You know, when I end up getting out of a trade too early, and I think there's there's no perfect solution to this. But I've been using a slightly different approach in recent months, not massively different, 
and and it all came together last week in in almost like a perfect textbook trade. It's worked really well. I, I just came out of the trade this morning, but it was it was euro dollar, and I was talking about this, I think uh, last week because the euro dollar we'd seen quite you know a steady decline for euro dollar um, through it looks like well most of October actually we'd seen we'd seen euro dollar just sell off. But I mentioned this. I've been mentioning these, these big levels for a while in euro dollar back from the beginning of this year. I did um, with Aondo a, a sort of a look ahead to the US election webinar about a week ago and I was looking at one of the things I was looking at were these, uh, these big levels on euro dollar, you know, because saying well if, if Clinton gets in maybe we'll see uh, the US dollar strengthen but actually maybe the US dollar has gone far enough when you look at levels like this. So I was thinking about well maybe we're going to see the start of a euro reversal, and I remember saying next week, but last week, you know, but don't go out and buy it straight away. Let's wait for a bit more confirmation. Of course, what I did was was completely ignore my own advice there. And last, um, it would have been last Thursday. So what was last Thursday? Was it the the 27th? I think last Thursday. So the moves when we were looking last week, where it had started to get interesting for me, the euro against the dollar was the fact. After having such a steady decline, we'd seen uh, the market early last week break out, break to these previous highs. And if you've attended these webinars before, you'll know for me how important you know I think previous highs and previous lows are. So by definition, if a market starts breaking the high of yesterday or the high of a couple of days ago, we're seeing real strength in the short term at least, and maybe a change in sentiment. So I think on Wednesday, <coughs> early hours of Wednesday, the euro had broken. Uh, the previous high, uh, and then you know, and then it sold off, and I was in uh, really early on Thursday morning because I, I did um, a couple of days on the radio last week where I get up at three o'clock in the morning, so my body clock was all out. So I was in looking at charts at about half past four in the morning on Thursday morning, and it would have been uh, around about here uh, on Euro dollar. Here we go, the early hours of the morning here. So it was trading around 109, and I thought, well, actually, you know, maybe maybe that this is this is a trading opportunity. We've seen the market break out, you know, bust through a couple of days at least of highs. The market had sold off, and there was a little bit, you know, a tiny bit of strength coming in in the early hours of the morning. So I thought, well, actually, if I'm a buyer here at 109, the logical place in my stop loss is not going to be a finger in the air stop loss, but it's below what I'd view as major support. So my stop went below here, below 108.50. I think in the end it went at 108.35. So I was a buyer at 109 with a stop at 108.35. So I had a 65 point stop loss on the trade. So for me, if I'm you know if I've got if I'm having a stop loss, I want to have a profit target that's at least three times that. So I want to you know reasonably think, well okay, if I'm risking 65, I want 180, 200 points on the upside, which is a move to, to here, up to uh, to 111. So I put, the, I put the trade on. So I bought at 109 with a stop loss at 108.35 and a target of 111. Now in the past, what I've done, I think I think something we all suffer from is moving um, stop losses too early. So you know, if the market moves 20, 30 points in your favor, some people will get a little bit shaken and think, right, I can't let that profit go away. I'm going to move my stop to break even so I have a free trade, which is fine, but of course a 20, 30 point move isn't really that much and it's perfectly logical. The market's going to come back, take out your stop and you're out the trade. So for me, what I've done what I've done for years is say, well, if, if I'm buying at 109 with a stop loss at 108.35, I've got 65 points worth of risk. The market has to move at least 65 points in my favor before I use a stop loss, before I move the stop loss, sorry. So it's got to move, if I'm happy to risk that amount, I should wait for the market to move that amount, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so when the market would move in my favor, I'd move my stop loss. But I've, I have changed my approach, because again, I, I found I was getting stopped at break even on a lot of trades that ended up being being winners. So I've tweaked it a little bit. So my, my rule now is, it's not rocket science, but it's got to move one and a half in my favor. So so basically, I bought at 109, stop at 108.35, 65 points away. So the market's got to move 65 times one and a half, whatever that is. It's about 100, isn't it? It's about 100 points. So I can't move my stop to break even until the market moves 100 points. So I was in here. The market traded up to 109.40. So I was up 40 points uh, on the trade. 
And as is often the case, the market sold off, and all that lovely profit has gone, and it dipped into loss. Uh, but then, towards uh, the end of last week, the market really started moving. You know, and it's and it's. So I was still in the trade. My stop loss is sitting down there. I'm in from there. The market's chopping around, and the market moved. And the market moved as high as 109.90. So I've got 90 points on the trade. I'm still not allowed to move my stop loss. Remember, because I've got a 65 point stop loss. The market's going to move 97 points for me to move my stop loss. So my stop loss at this point is still sitting down here and I'm sitting there thinking am I going to regret this you know because I've got 90 points on the table and I'm risking this trade turning into a loss Monday morning it was an odd one on Monday I was up in Wales earlier this week and I just sat there uh, sitting there just watching the market we're just inching its way down all day and I thought this is so frustrating so I ended up giving up 50 points uh, of the trade still in profit but then the market moved and then finally moved past my stop times one and a half points so when the market when I was 100 points in profit then I was allowed to move the stop so I moved the stop to break even and then it's a case of just trailing the stop up and this this happens rarely but because the market effectively yesterday and this morning went parabolic you know I just started moving my stop higher and higher uh, behind the market uh, you know and I think by this point here it was maybe sitting 20 points below where the market was I was tightening it as it gets nearer and nearer my target you know I'll make the stop tighter and tighter you know for example if, if the market was is here I've got 60 points left to go to my target if I'm trying to squeeze out 60 points profit I'd be stupid to have my stop loss 100 points away. So if, I, if I'm trying to squeeze out an extra 60, my stop loss at this point, where the trade is well in profit, might be 30 points away. And I just trail it and trail it and trail it. And in the end, I, I got stopped out this morning at, uh, at 78. So uh, 109, sorry, no, one, well, yeah, 110, 110, 78. So it made um, 178 points on the trade. And um, but the point I'm making was, in terms of the, in terms of me moving my stop, you know, I was, I did well to sit there and give the market a little bit of room to move around. So for me, it's an approach that has worked better. It has delivered, I think, less frustrating trading results in recent months. You know, I don't set myself up as some sort of trading genius. I'm the same as everyone else. I'm sitting there and trying to trying to make money um, out of my trades and trying to trying to make more when I'm right. Uh, than I lose when I'm wrong and for me th this patience of maybe waiting for the market to move a little bit further before I move my stop loss has worked better in terms of keeping me in the profitable trades of course if I get the direction wrong then I'm wrong you know like on the that, that spike down on dollar Canada uh, the other week and I did a trade on the Bund last week as well in the early hours in the morning where um, it got stopped out pretty quickly. It got stopped out within within a couple of hours. It just went sailing through my stop. So if I'm wrong, I'm going to be wrong. But in terms of, um, I think, sticking with maybe the, the bigger winners, it's an approach I think this may be worthy of some consideration. So for me, make, make it, make, waiting for the market to move one and a half times my stop before I start moving it to break even is something that's worked well. So um, there we go. Let's see. Let's see how it performs over the next week. I will give you updates. I don't think I'll be doing much actually over the next week until this election's out of the way, but I'll, I'll sort of update during November as to how it's getting on. So going back to the, the bigger picture for Euro dollar, I don't know at the moment. You know, I, think we, I think we've reversed clearly off this level. For me, it's come a long way in the last week. If we, if we dip back down, I'd be looking for a buying opportunity. Again, I'd be looking for the, the same trade uh, to set up again. You, there's a lot of potential resistance up at these levels, you know, so I, I don't think I'd be a buyer just yet on Euro dollar. But if it dips back down towards the 109 level because of these, you know, these massive historical supports from, from December and February this year, I'd always fancy being a Euro dollar buyer down at these sort of levels. Let's see what happens. Let's um, have a look at our own currency, of course, the, uh, the uh, ever volatile pound. There's that story over the weekend. Which I, I personally I thought was a bit of a non-story, but but Twitter and the papers were full of it. All about the the, the Mark Carney story, the governor of the Bank of England. When's Mr. Carney? Is he going to stay on? Is he going to go? Blah 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 blah. blah. Um, and the pound did not react at all uh, on um, on Sunday when it opened. I think we did see a bit of a bounce when he confirmed he was staying to um, 2019, isn't it? I think he's staying until at least. But it's in, actually it's interesting now. 
it's interesting now the pound because actually it is where we are now this I think I've, I think we've, we've looked at this sort of this maybe this 123 area just to remind ourselves what's going on in recent history we had that really weird flash crash uh, on the pounds beginning of October where it got absolutely mullered in Asian trading and no one really knows knows why but it did and then it then it sold off um, but you can see this whole I don't know what 120 to 121 area has been a, a form of support, and we've seen rallies. Uh, I've been saying that you know, just don't don't trust the rallies. You know, it's a market that's still incredibly weak. But maybe maybe this is a slightly a slightly different rally because this has been there. We go. That's the barrier about 123.20, and we're currently trading 123.29. So I suppose the aggressive strategy here would be to go short. To view this as a false breakout and a stop loss, I don't know, 123.60, 123.70, and look for it to go back down into this sort of low 122s. But I think it's interesting. I think if it can hold this sort of level, maybe we can start building, you know, a, a stronger recovery back up to, to the heady heights of it being worth nearly a dollar twenty-five. But again, I think with the U.S. election happening, who knows over the next couple of days. But I think it's, it's interesting, at least anyway, that it has managed to crack this level that's been holding it down for three weeks. But let's see what happens. Let's see if it can hang on. Already it's dipped back below it. So maybe, maybe, that, is, maybe that is the better trade, is to treat this as an odd spike, sell into it, and a stop above. I think that's, that's one way of looking at it. But on the flip side, if it continues to push higher, I think we could well see a test of one, the 124.50. And if it breaks this level, I think that's when we've got maybe a more interesting recovery story. So the pound's an interesting one to watch. I must admit, I've not paid much attention to it in the last couple of weeks because I think it's a little bit too crazy. But I think um, with, it, with it breaking these sort of levels, let's see. Let's see what it does over the, over the next couple of days. And then, um, then uh, finally on the currencies, I don't know, actually, maybe let's do a couple. Dollar Canada, we, we've touched on this a bit uh, in recent weeks, the dollar against the Canadian dollar because we have had over the years, some fantastic trends, fantastic uptrend for a good couple of years, then a downtrend for much of this year. Then, you know, as I think as I've been saying uh, in recent recent weeks, we've seen it crack some big levels on the way up the dollar against the Canadian dollar. So for me, you know, we've seen I don't know if we say resistance there has gone, that's you know, that's, that's well gone. Now uh, resistance here has gone. You know, that, that it's a market that is breaking out. To um, what new six, seven month highs? Uh, if we talk about trend, of course, the trend is uh, clearly up off those lows. So for me, a bit like the New Zealand dollar, uh, where that trend is up, we're maybe a little bit overextended. Let's put some squiggly lines on the bottom uh, just to see what the what the. Uh, there we go. Let's make it a 10 day RSI. Okay, the 10 day RSI. It's a bit overbought, which is not surprising considering maybe the move we've had. But for me, if we saw it dip back down towards the low 130s, I'd be looking to buy in and hopefully this time not get stopped out before the market ramps up uh, 300 points. But I think for the, for the shorter term traders, there, there are some levels up here. You can see how over what the last week, week and a half, sort of 132.80 to 133.60, what a good level of support that's been. So again, an aggressive trade, you know, we're seeing a bit of strength coming in on the current hour, actually we've, we've only just started, no, actually we're just coming to the end of the current hour, so it's a minute to one. So one, you know, if you really want to be a buyer, you could be a buyer now with maybe a stop under this low or this low. Uh, for me, I'd probably prefer to see a bit of a deeper sell-off on the dailies, but I think dollar Canada, like the dollar New Zealand, the New Zealand dollar, US dollar, Looks to be a buy, a buy on weakness, and finally dollar yen. Dollar yen is the same old story. Dollar yen, uh, you know, we've 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 got that trend in place, that downtrend in place. The big question is, what is what's going on in dollar yen over the last few months? Uh, the start of a reversal. I don't know. You know, I think we need to see it break 108 to um, really confirm that. But any weakness back down towards 100, the buyers come back in. You know, it's rallied once again. 500 points off that level. We're a little bit sort of stuck in the middle again, I think, at the moment. Let's take a look on the hourlies. There we go. But again, I suppose we're, we're, for 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 those people who like watching hourly charts, and I definitely 
you know, count myself among those, we are coming back to, on the hourlies at least, the 102.80 area. So that could be an interesting one to watch over the next couple of days if we do see that 102.80 hold for maybe another go back at a 105 zone. So I think, I think it's interesting. You know, it's always interesting, Dolly M, plenty of volatility. The bigger picture is still a little bit confused, I think, but it's interesting because maybe we're seeing a base forming in, um, in Dolly M. And finally, let's take a look at uh, some of the commodities. Let's take a look at oil and gold. Um, oil has been such a, it's such a swine of a market oil, isn't it? It's that, it had that little poke out oil uh, through the, the old highs for the year, very briefly, I think nudged through by about 40 cents, and then uh, has promptly reversed by about 10% uh, the price of oil. So I think, I think it's a difficult one to call oil. I think it is one of my, I think like I said last week, it's not a favourite market of mine. There's plenty of volatility, but um, this is uh, crude oil, US crude oil December that we're looking at here. But over the last couple of weeks, you can see that the trend has been down. We're trading now just below $46 a barrel. Uh, for me, I would still be tempted to think we'll see the mark, we'll see the price of oil have another go up at the 50s again. But um, on that chart, we've not got much data on that chart. I'll try and and I'll do a bit of digging around and see for next time if I can find a chart with a bit more data on it. Um, so we can have a look at maybe some historical levels. But the market that has been moving, and I, is of course gold. You know, on a classic safe haven bet, gold. I'll send a link round if you hadn't seen it to the recording of the U.S. election webinar I did. It's, it's only half an hour long, but it's talking about you know what would move if Clinton got in or if Trump got in. But gold, you know, interestingly enough, you know, we've been, I've been banging on about this this 1250 level in gold in recent weeks, and we've finally seen it start motoring um, over the last week. You know, I still, I still think you know, the trend for gold is still up, even though we've lost, uh, we've lost that uptrend that had been in place. It hasn't really broken you know, major, major supports on the daily chart. So that was, that was our old uptrend that we lost when it went crashing through the $1,300 an ounce mark. Uh, but you know, it sort of consolidated down here. And we're off again. And I think if it can, for me, I think it's going back up here. I think it's going back to 1370. Me. So for me, I wouldn't maybe be a buyer here. So I might end up missing the boat. If it cooled off a bit over the next few days, came back down and rallied, uh, then I think maybe for me that's the opportunity. And if it doesn't happen, then it doesn't happen. But I think you know, as long as gold stays above these May lows, which are, or is it, about $1,200 an ounce, I think. The, the, the medium to longer term outlook for me anyway for the price of gold is for it to continue to move uh, to move higher. We'll see, we'll see what happens, but I'm, I'm pleased actually, even though I'm not in it, I'm pleased it's got a bit of a move on over the last week after sort of hanging around that 1250 area for what felt like you know quite some time, just bashing about and it started picking up again. But I do think that gold is going to go back and have a look at those highs from earlier in the year, up about 1370. Let's see. Let's see what happens. So we'll start wrapping things up there. Um, I, hope, I hope it's been useful today. A little bit different, maybe looking at that, at that stop thing. Like it's, it's no holy grail, but I think for me it's really helped um, try and eliminate, you know, at least some of the frustration of trading where you get knocked out and see the market go the way you thought it was going to go. You know, just maybe giving it, giving the market a little bit of um, breathing space. But but like I say, I think the next couple of days. For me, U.S. stock markets is where it is all at, you know, because we saw this is the S&P, the daily chart. We saw the break yesterday on the S&P. Uh, we didn't see the Dow break. So, famous last words. I think we'll see something of a nervous session today, which starts in 25 minutes because of the clock difference. But uh, the big levels to watch: the lows in the in the S&P from yesterday, and this this 17,900 level in the Dow. And I think if we saw those levels broken, you know, we could well see a bit more pressure on stock markets. But for now, maybe the aggressive trade is to look to be a buyer with a stop under those levels and see if the markets push back into their range. But um, we've got the payrolls on Friday, so plenty of volatility on Friday, the U.S. unemployment figures. Uh, then, of course, next Tuesday is the uh, U.S. presidential election, Trump or Clinton. What a wonderful choice the, uh, the Americans have there. And then we'll do this all again on Wednesday. So we'll see where we are uh, this time next week. Uh, like I say, I'll send that recording out to, uh, to, uh, to those of you who are here today. And if you, if you want it, if you're watching the recording of this webinar 
and you want the recording of the, the Trump Clinton webinar, I'll just put my, I think my details are up there. There we go. So you can drop me an email, david at tradeafter.com, and follow me on Twitter. I'll, I'll put it on Twitter as well, at Jones the Markets. Um, you know, one of the things I'm doing with Aondo is webinars on social trading. So there's one of those coming up next Tuesday, actually. It's on presidential election day. So we'll talk about that. They're very good in terms of copy trading and following other traders. So I'll talk. Uh, a lot more about that next Tuesday. But for now, for the market outlook, we'll wrap things up there. I think we've got a very interesting uh, week ahead, and we'll do it all again next Wednesday. So I hope your trading goes well, and hopefully see you back here this time next week. Okay, thanks very much.